What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Ardell, and in today's video, I'm going to be showing you all the Sturm Gambit, a very interesting option for white, especially for the birds opening player. I personally really enjoy the birds opening. It's a reverse Dutch-like system with a tempo ahead, a flank opening where we play F4 while still fighting for the center of the board without using either of our center pawns. Now in my games personally, and if you look online at master and grandmaster level games, the most popular option for black, and it's not even close, is the move d5. And honestly, this d5 move makes a ton of sense. Black could play a move like e5 going into the Fromm's Gambit, but this is very rich and complex in opening theory. So oftentimes black will simply play d5 using a center pawn to fight for the center of the board, continue with natural developmental moves like knight of six, e6, bishop e7, maybe knight c6, castle kingside, or just playing chess. And with white, usually with the birds opening, we play knight f3 and then have a really big decision to make on what to do with our light squared bishop. Do we want to play e3, put the bishop on e2, and then castle kingside? Or do we want to play g3, Fianchetto the bishop, and castle kingside? In either case, I think that this b3 and bishop b2 option is a very key idea, taking control of this very nice diagonal. But with the Sturm Gambit, we're not going to play normal boards opening chess, but play the crazy looking move, c4. With this, we put pressure on d5 and have ourselves the Sturm Gambit. And generally speaking, black has three main options. Black can take the pawn on c4, black can push the pawn to d4, or black can simply develop their pieces with a move like knight f6, e6, or c6. We're going to be covering each of these three options that black has. Let's first go over the main question. What happens if black takes this pawn on c4? This is personally my favorite move to play against. It leads to some very exciting and interesting games. Here we're going to continue with e3 attacking the pawn on c4. Now I actually think it's in black's best interest not to defend this pawn on c4 and let us take it with a tempo putting pressure on this f7 pawn. But what if... Black wants to defend the pawn at all costs and plays a move like bishop e6, queen d5, or the move b5. Well, against b5, we have to be careful not to play a move like knight f3 or bishop b2 because then black will have time to play moves like a6 and c6 and have a very strong pawn chain on the queen side of the board. That's going to be hard to break up. Right now we're down a pawn, so we have to go after this pawn on b5 right away with a4. And now if black takes the pawn on a4, we can simply take that c4 pawn with the bishop. The a4 pawn can be taken whenever we'd like, and we're simply playing developmental chess. I like white's game there. And if the move a6 is played, we take the pawn on b5. And if a takes b5, we win ourselves a rook on a8. What about the move c6? Black may be tempted to do this, and it seems as if following the moves a takes b5 and c takes b5, black has successfully held on to the pawn on c4. I mean, we no longer have a pawn on a2 to throw to this b5 pawn, but surprisingly, we're going to play the move queen f3 attacking this rook on a8, and there's actually no way for black to stop this besides playing the move knight c6, giving up an entire minor piece. We're simply going to take that knight off the board, and now after a move like bishop d7, continue with queen b7, both the queen and the rook here attacking this pawn. And on top of being up a piece for only a pawn, we have great attacking chances here. We can play knight c3, attacking b5. We can play knight f3, and then pounce our knight into the e5 square. A very nice centralized spot. To say the least, this is completely winning for white. So that covers the move b5. We're going to play a4, and if the move c6 is played, take that pawn off the board, continue with queen f3, and we have ourselves either a knight or the rook on a8. What about the move queen d5? I personally don't think this is the best option for black. This queen is very exposed in the center of the board, and it can't defend this pawn on c4 forever. Here we can simply continue with the move like knight f3, and following knight f6, we now have two choices. I'll show you both, and you can pick whichever one you prefer. The first one is very simple. We're going to play knight c3, attacking the queen on d5 with tempo, and if a move like queen c5, continue with queen a4 check, attacking the king on e8, and the very next move, we're going to take that pawn on c4. We don't have to be worried about black taking our queen here. Yes, at move seven, we have officially had a queen trade, but now with bishop takes c4, we're putting pressure on f7. We have ourselves a pretty nice edge 
in development. And on top of that, this pawn can come to d4 very soon. I think this is pretty easy to play with the white pieces. I mean, let's say black plays a move like knight c6. We simply castle kingside. We then continue with d4. We have a pawn chain, and really, we are trying to take control of the dark squares. We have knight b5 ideas, knight e5 ideas. We can simply continue with a move like b3, fianchetto of the bishops, get these rooks involved. I like white's game here. So that's the first option. Play a move like knight c3, attack that queen on d5, and then continue with queen a4, followed by taking that pawn. The second option is the one I prefer, and that's knight a3, a more hyper-modern response. Usually, we don't want to move our knight to the rim of the board. As y'all can see, this knight can only see four squares, while the knight on f3 can currently see eight. We usually don't want to bring our knight to the edge of the board because it just doesn't have as much mobility, but right now, with our knight on a3 and our bishop on f1, we're both attacking this pawn on c4. This knight is planning on taking towards the center of the board, and the only way that black can defend this pawn is through the move b5, which I think is a mistake because we now have b3. Notice how we keep attacking this pawn chain on b5 and c4. If a move like c takes b3, we can take with either the bishop or my personal preference, knight takes b5. We're now threatening knight takes c7 with check, attacking the king, queen, and rook. So black does not want to allow this. We'll probably play a move like queen b7. We can either take this pawn and have ourselves at even material or play a crazy looking attacking move like bishop a3, really trying to control this a3 to f8 diagonal. If a move like b takes a2 and rook takes a2, yes, we're down a pawn, but I think white has more than enough compensation. I mean, if black plays a move like knight bd7, we play rook b2 aiming our rook towards the opponent's queen. We are currently threatening knight d6 with check, winning the opponent's queen. We have knight e5 ideas eventually, knight d4, knight g5. This bishop can come to c4. This queen can come to b3 or a4. We have a very nice edge in development, attacking chances, and I think that any Sturm Gambit player would be happy in this position. So that covers the move queen d5. We simply develop with something like knight f3 and then eventually play either knight a3 attacking this pawn with both our knight and our bishop, or just play knight c3, attack the queen, and then continue with this queen a4 check idea, have ourselves even material with a slight edge in development. What about the move bishop e6? Well, against bishop e6, defending this pawn, I like the move knight f3, and following knight c6, this knight a3 option. Again, we're using both our knight and our bishop to attack this pawn on c4, and the only way for black to defend this pawn is through knight a5. Notice that black can only really defend this pawn through some pretty awkward moves. This bishop on e6 is stopping the pawn on e7, therefore stopping this bishop on f8, and the knight on a5 is a little bit awkwardly placed. Here we can play queen c2, continuing to attack the pawn while naturally developing our pieces, not putting them on awkward squares where it makes our position cramped like black is. If a move like knight f6, we can now take that pawn on c4. We can take with either the knight or the bishop. Honestly, it might not matter which one we take with. I think black's best option is probably just to trade down here after bishop takes c4, take again. I wouldn't say that white is completely winning this position, but I would definitely give white the edge. So that covers the move bishop e6, in which we're simply going to develop our pieces with something like knight f3, and then knight a3, attacking this pawn on c4 with both our knight and our bishop on f1. If black wants to play awkward moves like a knight c6 and knight a5 trying to defend that pawn at all costs, we're completely okay with that. We're going to play queen c2, and while black is putting itself in a very awkward position, we're simply going to naturally develop our pieces take that pawn, and come out with the edge. But as I've mentioned before, I actually think it's in black's best interest not to defend the pawn and simply play something like knight c6. And now we're simply going to play knight f3. This is a key move here. We may be tempted to take the pawn on c4 with our bishop right away, but then black could play e5, breaking this position open with some pretty good attacking chances by playing knight f3 and having our pawn on f4. We are really trying to clamp down the centralized e5 square and then the next move we can continue by taking that pawn after a move like e6 we can castle kingside continue with knight c3 play d4 pushing in the center of the board again we're really trying to take control of the dark squares here knight e5 can be played anytime and it's very nice having a light squared bishop that has some mobility and freedom to move around in this position 
Here, if black plays a move like a6, looking to play b5, I must warn you guys, I really don't like the move a4 because it weakens our dark squares on a5 and b4. So I personally just like a3. And if black wants to push with b5, we're completely okay with that. We're simply going to continue with something like queen c2, forming a battery ram, attacking that pawn on h7 so that this knight cannot move. And if a move like knight a5, again, knight e5 is always available. And it's very hard for black to come up with any real type of counterplay. For example, if black continues with b4 here, they're actually probably going to lose a piece. We're going to take this pawn and following Bishop takes b4, play knight a2, attacking this bishop. And the whole idea is that following bishop e7, we have b4 attacking this knight on a5. And the knight is actually trapped. We're about to win this knight and about to have a clearly won game. So that covers the move d takes c4, which I think any Sturm Gambit player should be pretty excited about whenever black takes that pawn. I think white will always come out with a slightly better position and maybe not even a slight edge, but a one game very quickly. The other two options are pushing the pawn and after that just developing a piece. Let's first go over the move d4. I must admit white is in a little bit of an awkward position. We can't move our pawn on e2 to e3 or e4 because black would simply play d takes e3. I think here we have to play knight f3 and following knight f6 get our bishop on g2 by playing g3 followed by a move like bishop g2. Notice how strong this diagonal is from h1 to a8. And if a move like g6, continue with d3. This is the pawn structure we want to have against d4 and e2 to c4 pawn chain and at h2 to f4 pawn chain with an active light squared bishop here. After a move like bishop g7, we're simply going to castle kingside. And after castling kingside, we have to attack here. We can't play passive chess, simply playing moves like king h1 or queen e1 and queen f2. We have to either attack on the queen side of the board or the king side of the board because black obviously has the edge in the center of the board with this d4 pawn. We also have to be careful about knight g4 and knight e3 ideas, but thankfully our dark squared bishop on c1 is protecting that square. I personally like attacking on the king side of the board. Firstly, this h3 move stops any ideas of knight g4, and the very next move we can play a move like g4. I know this formation probably looks a little crazy, playing h3 and g4, but really what we're trying to do is create space. We're not necessarily trying to checkmate this king on g8, but create Create space on the king side of the board and get ourselves some counterattacking chances. If black plays a move like h5, we're completely fine with locking this position up and gaining a space advantage on the king side. And if a move like e5 breaking right in the center of the board, we can take that pawn with our knight, continue by trading off. And after a move like rook takes e5, continue with bishop f4 with tempo attacking that centralized piece. And now if rook e6, continue with knight d2. White's position is a little bit cramped, but I think with good play, white is completely fine and can have some pretty good counterattacking chances. For example, white can continue with moves like bishop g3, king h2, maybe queen e1, and then bringing the queen to either f2, g3, or h4. We can always play knight f3, attacking that pawn on d4 with potential knight e5 and knight g5 ideas. I mean, just to give you guys an example, I personally would probably go with something like rook f2, defending that pawn on e2, then bishop g3, king h2, maybe queen f1 and rook e1. As y'all can see, our pieces are very close together, and it may seem cramped, but our bishop pair is very active, putting pressure on the queen side of the board and following this whole formation of playing rook f2, maybe queen f1 and rook e1, we can then have an e3 or e4 break. I like white's game there. So that covers the move d4. We're going to play d3, have an e2 to c4 pawn chain, play g3, have an h2 to f4 pawn chain, put our bishop on g2, naturally develop our pieces, attack on either the queen side or the king side here, and I like white's game. What if black just leaves the pawn on d5 and simply plays a move like e6? Well, here we're simply going to continue with knight f3, and if a move like c5, play e3. After knight c6, continue with knight c3, and some may be a little bit pessimistic about playing this move because of this d4 option attacking our knight, but honestly, I think that white is completely fine following knight e4. If black takes this pawn on a3, we take back and queen takes d1 is played. I actually think that we have a roughly even game there. And if bishop e7 is played, I like this bishop d3 move. This looks a little bit awkward, but the whole idea is that whenever black takes the pawn 
pawn on e3 we take back and now we are defending that bishop on d3 it may seem as if black can start attacking us right away with a move like knight b4 but this actually doesn't work our position may seem a little bit awkward but we actually have ourselves a pretty nice game we have a solid knight pair on e4 and f3 and if knight b4 is played we can simply play bishop e2 and following queen takes d1 play bishop takes d1 here if a move like knight d3 check we can simply continue with king e2 there's nothing to worry about here if knight takes c1 we take that knight back we have a centralized knight on e4 putting pressure on that c5 pawn a nice knight on f3 ready to pounce into the e5 square and a bishop on d1 that can either come to c2 or a4 attacking the opponent's king we can always put a rook on d1 and i think white has a pretty nice game if you'd like to learn more on the theory behind the birds opening, click the video to the left. If you'd like to check out our entire birds opening playlist, click that link to the right. Leave a comment to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered from this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.